thank you, Magda, for both that nice introduction and also for this the invitation um, to come here. Uh, I first saw the website when Magda introduced it last fall, I think, at the 16th Century Studies Conference. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, it's really a wonderful idea to do things this way. I think it's going to be really useful. I've been for a long time an advocate of um, doing translations, both for students and for those of us who like to do comparative history. Uh, that sometimes sets people's teeth on edge because they feel that if you don't really the original languages, you have absolutely no business working in the history of that particular culture. Um, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> I teach at a state university and not a first rank one. My students are not going to be learning lots of foreign languages and I still want them to have the ability to use a lot of original sources uh, as they're doing their, their work, certainly my undergraduates and occasionally my graduates. And I'm at an age right now where I don't think that I'm going to be learning a whole lot of new languages. My son's trying to convince me to learn Japanese. Um, he promises he'll teach me. Um, he taught me to scuba dive. So maybe he can teach me Japanese. Um, I think scuba diving was easier, than, certainly quicker, than learning Japanese. Um, but I think that, uh, as you know, and I'm preaching to the converted here, um, that providing translations for people available on the website um, is really a wonderful resource. Um, and I think that in terms of the, um, the aim, as Magda has explained to me, about integrating Jewish history better into the kind of general thrust of the early modern period, um, that I can't imagine anything that would do that better than exactly what you're doing. So it's really great. Um, all right, that's the end of the cheerleading. Um, one, one of the marks traditionally associated with modernity is the increasing importance of persons as individuals rather than members of social groups. This really comes as long ago as Jakob Burkhardt, who in the 19th century really created our idea of what the Renaissance was. Burkhardt saw individuality as one of its defining features. He wrote, in the Middle Ages, man was conscious of himself only as a member of a race, people, party, family, or corporation, only through some general category. In Italy of the Renaissance, man became a spiritual individual. In the century and a half since Burkhardt wrote, his notions of the individualism of the Renaissance and of individualism as a central aspect of modernity have been rejected, rethought, and revised along several lines. Medieval historians, and I imagine there might be a few here, have asserted that the individual was important in learned philosophy, theology, and political theory, as well as popular songs, poems, and stories, at least since the 10th century, and maybe even earlier. Conversely, scholars of the early modern period have emphasized that groups of all sorts, families, clans, neighborhoods, guilds, remained extremely important into the 18th century or even into the 21st for many people. This was particularly true for the nobility and for the broad mass of common people, but even among the primary subjects of Burkhardt's study, upper class Italian Christian men living in cities, corporate groups remained central to their understanding of themselves and their place in the world. Along with these doubts, though, about the individualism of the Renaissance and the early modern period, has come a new interest in aspects of people's lives as individuals that were not part of what concerned Burkhardt. He focused on intellectual and cultural issues among a small group. But more recently, historians have turned their attention to all sorts of people and a much wider range of issues. Their physical bodies, their identities as men and women, their sexuality, their experiences with aging, and so on. This newer scholarship on the individual simultaneously broadens and problematizes earlier studies. We now know a great deal more about all kinds of early modern individuals than we did even 20 years ago, but we also recognize how much those individuals were enmeshed in various social relationships and networks of power, and how much they perceived of themselves as members of various groups. 